These are all amino acids condensing together to form a polypeptide. Some proteins remain as a long chain polypeptide like this, but there are some proteins that look like this. Yes, it is an amazing protein. And no, the protein is not showing off since it is in this structure adapted to its function. So to answer amino acids question on how proteins do this, join me in BioWorld to learn more about the protein world. In today's syllabus, we shall discuss the levels of organization that is primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. And as we discuss the tertiary and quaternary levels of organization, we shall also discuss the process of denaturation and renaturation. The first level of organization is protein as a primary structure. All proteins must start as a primary structure. It is a long and linear polypeptide chain where the amino acids are held together by peptide bonds. If you notice, each of the amino acids here have a different color indicating that they are different since there are altogether 20 different amino acids to choose from. The arrangement of these amino acids depend on the genetic code in the nucleus of the cell. Once the primary proteins become too long, they have to organize themselves into a secondary structure. They can do this by either coiling or folding. When they coil, they form a structure called the alpha helix structure. And when these long chain polypeptides fold, they form a beta pleated sheet. In the alpha helix structure of the secondary protein, the peptide bonds hold the amino acids together and the overall structure of the alpha helix is maintained by hydrogen bonding. If you observe, the coils in the alpha helix have the same width as well as the same distance from one another. This happens because of the hydrogen bonding between every fourth amino acid. So if I take this black circle as the first amino acid, this will be the second amino acid, third amino acid, and here is the fourth amino acid. So there will be a hydrogen bond between both these amino acids. And this pattern will be repeated along the length of the alpha helix. The hydrogen bonding actually occurs between the oxygen from the carbonyl group of one amino acid and the hydrogen of the amine group of another amino acid. So if these two molecules represent the first amino acid and the fourth amino acid, and the lines over here are the peptide bonds, we will find that the oxygen from this carbonyl group and the hydrogen from this amine group will form the hydrogen bond. So, in the alpha helix secondary protein structure, there are two bonds involved, both the peptide bond as well as the hydrogen bond. Unfortunately, not all amino acids can enable the polypeptide chain to coil. The reason is because the side chains of some of the amino acids repel against one another. The amino acids that repel against one another will be 
amino acids with side chains that are both nonpolar or both acidic or basic or the amino acids can be both proline or can be both cysteine. The reasons for why they repel are when the side chains are nonpolar, both the side chains will be hydrophobic. So they will repel. If both side chains are acidic or basic, the side chains will become charged. If both are acidic, both will become negatively charged. If both are basic, both become positively charged. And as you know, similar charges will repel. Now, if both amino acids are proline, they also repel because proline's side chain is cyclic. The cyclic side chains are hydrophobic. Proline, after all, is a nonpolar amino acid. So, since they are hydrophobic, they will repel. But amino acid that is cysteine is actually polar. Yet, it will prevent coiling of the polypeptide chain because cysteine has a side chain containing sulfur. So when both side chains have sulfur, instead of forming a hydrogen bond, the sulfurs will form a disulfide bond, once again preventing the coiling of the polypeptide chain. Since the polypeptide chains cannot coil, they will fold like in this diagram, where you can see the polypeptide chain is moving downwards and then it folds to move in the opposite direction upwards. The amino acids inside the beta pleated sheet will be held together by peptide bonds and you can notice that the folding has a standard distance. So this distance is maintained by the hydrogen bonding between the oxygen in the carbonyl group of one amino acid and the hydrogen from the amine group of another amino acid. But this time, it is not between the fourth amino acid, as in alpha helix, but between the adjacent amino acids. So, like here, you see it is against the amino acid on the chain that is moving downwards and the amino acid on the opposite chain moving upwards. So the hydrogen bonding is exactly the same as in the alpha helix pattern that is between the oxygen from the carbonyl group of one amino acid and the hydrogen of the amine group of another amino acid. So now the polypeptide chains have coiled and have folded and yet they are still too long. So what happens next? The next thing to do is to roll. So the polypeptides now will roll into a three-dimensional globular structure. This structure needs many bonds to maintain this three-dimensional shape. The bonds include ionic bonds, disulfide bridge, hydrogen bonds, and even hydrophobic interactions called the van der Waals. Ionic bonds happen between amino acids that have acidic and basic side chains. Disulfide bridge will form when the amino acids are cysteine. Hydrogen bonding will form between amino acids with polar side chains, and the hydrophobic interactions will occur between amino acids with nonpolar side chains. So it is the interaction between all these four different types of bonds that will help maintain the tertiary structure of the protein. So far we have noticed the primary, secondary and tertiary structures of proteins involve only one polypeptide. But if more than one polypeptide 
interacts with one another, then we form the quaternary structure. This structure is also maintained by the same bonds that maintain the tertiary structure, that is the ionic bonds, the hydrogen bonds, the disulfide bonds, as well as hydrophobic interactions. The tertiary and quaternary proteins are very dependent on the interaction between bonds. So they are extremely sensitive and can be easily denatured. Denaturation is when the protein loses its three-dimensional conformation and becomes a primary structure. This happens when the proteins are exposed to denaturating agents such as heat, strong acids of strong bases, radiation, organic solvents or even detergents, as well as heavy metals. What happens during the exposure to denaturating agents is that the bonds that maintain this three-dimensional structure, like the ionic bonds, the hydrogen bonds, and the disulfide bonds, break. So without the bonds, the three-dimensional structure cannot be maintained, and this causes the protein to become a primary structure once again. Without the three-dimensional structure, the protein has no function. However, the bonds in the primary protein, that is the peptide bond, are not affected by the denaturating agents. This is because peptide bonds can only be broken down by enzymes like protease. Therefore, the sequence or the arrangement of the amino acids will not be affected. But there is a process that is opposite of denaturation that is called renaturation. In renaturation, the primary protein that formed due to denaturation can be reversed back to its original 3D structure. This occurs when we remove the denaturating agent. However, this does not apply to all proteins all of the time. It is only in special cases where renaturation can occur. So, we have completed our discussion on the various levels of organization and also discuss denaturation as well as renaturation. Let us next move on to part F where we shall learn to classify the proteins. There are three ways to classify proteins. Firstly, based on their structure, which we actually just covered. Secondly, is based on their function, which actually we should have covered earlier, but I saved it for this discussion. And the third way is by composition of the protein. So let me summarize the classification that is based on structure, function and component. So if based on structure, we can classify proteins into four categories that is primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. But if we are classifying based on function, we can only divide into three categories, that is fibrous proteins, globular proteins, and intermediate proteins. Notice that I've used the same color for the primary and secondary proteins and the fibrous proteins. This is because both primary and secondary proteins form the fibrous protein. Similarly, tertiary and quaternary proteins form the globular protein. The third method of classification is based on components where we only have two groups. Either the protein is a simple protein or a 
conjugated protein. So since I've completed discussion based on structure, let's move on to based on function. The first classification based on function is a fibrous protein. This is an example of a fibrous protein called collagen. Collagen is made up of three polypeptide chains, which are basically primary in structure, but they twist into a helix. However, there will be hydrogen bonds forming at the cross links of the three polypeptides, meaning when these three polypeptides touch each other, there will be hydrogen bond forming. Another type of fibrous protein is the type that uses both alpha helix or beta pleated sheets. This is the fibrous protein called keratin. The fibrous proteins have a lot of hydrogen bonds. Therefore, these proteins are insoluble and since they twist into helix pattern you find that they are elastic and the hydrogen bonds help them have high tensile strength meaning that they can be stretched but not that easily broken so these type of characteristics make fibrous proteins which are both primary and secondary proteins very suitable for the function of structure. Collagen is found in our tendons and ligaments, whereas keratin is found in our hair as well as our nails. The second group is the globular protein. Globular proteins can be either tertiary proteins like this enzyme, which carries out biochemical reactions or globular proteins can be from the quaternary proteins like this diagram here which is an immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulins are actually antibodies and you see they have a variety of colors in here representing different polypeptides. Immunoglobulins carry out immunological reactions. Globular proteins you see are folded to form a somewhat spherical shape, making them quite compact and slightly soluble in water, or in this case, blood. And we know that one of the characteristics of protein is, since they are slightly soluble, they form colloids. By being a colloid, the enzyme or the antibodies can sort of float in our blood and easily be transported to parts of our body that need them. We look now at the third group that is intermediate proteins. Intermediate proteins can be found in the blood clotting process. It involves a protein called fibrinogen which is originally soluble in our blood plasma. But during blood clotting, the fibrinogen will convert into fibrin which becomes insoluble and able to trap the red blood cells causing blood to clot. The intermediate protein is the fibrinogen protein because it is a secondary protein and secondary proteins are fibrous proteins. But if you remember, fibrous proteins should be insoluble because they are suited for structural function. But fibrinogen is a fibrous protein, yet it is soluble to carry out the blood clotting process. So this is an example of an intermediate group of proteins. Now we've covered classification based on structure as well as function. Let's move on to the final one based on component. This is a simple protein. Simple proteins can be primary, secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary proteins. What makes them simple is that they are 100% amino acid. They do not have any other type of molecule attached to them. 
proteins like these are albumin, globulin, and even insulin. Conjugated proteins are different. They are limited to tertiary and quaternary proteins that are the globular kind. And the difference is that these proteins have a non-protein material attached to them. We call these non-protein materials as prostatic groups. For example, we take hemoglobin. The red and the blue parts of the hemoglobin are purely protein. They are amino acid. But if you notice, there is this green part in the hemoglobin. This green part is the non-protein material or the prostatic group. We call it as heme, which will contain the mineral ferro. So hemoglobin is an example of a conjugated protein. With that, we have learned all about the classification of proteins. So until I meet you in my next video, bye-bye from BioWorld.